what some other philosophers and computer scientists at the time said, kind of phrased as like what computers can't do or what computers shouldn't do. Um, and this is really one of those worst case scenario type um, extrapolations of those issues. Right. I think what popped to mind when, um, when talking about the development of kind of the concerns of artificial intelligence, computers, stuff like that, right? Is this was a big theme and continues to be a big theme in Gene, Gene Roddenberry's portrayal of Star Trek, right? It's, it's a humanistic kind of mission of how does humanity interact with not just, you know, other alien species, but also computers. Um, and I mean, this is highly highlighted in or highly noticeable in the episode where Commander Data in the next generation is put on trial. Um, and the question is, because he's an, he's an android, he's a synthetic, should he be tried as a human or a machine? Is he a human or a machine? And so that's the, because one of the people from uh, Starfleet Academy wants to take data, commander data, and <laughs> disassemble him and research him because he's fascinating. He's the first android to be human-like too. But Data also has an intense curiosity with humanity. And so I think this is a, a interesting book to look at, right? Because that is, in a sense, I'm sure we'll get into this, but as I read the book, um, Sure, we can talk about what technology is unable to do. But we, I was struck by the fact that by the end of the book, even though Am is perceived to be an evil overlord, basically, um, who does not desire the people's good, right? I left the book feeling very sad for the machine um, because, but I'll get into that later. So yeah, I think this is a, this is a theme which is not outside of popular culture, um, even right now today for sure. Sophia the robot guys. I think that's a really, that's a really interesting segue. And I want to read very briefly uh, just one line from the actual story itself, which kind of relates to, you know, you're, you're bringing up different examples of sentient machines, and Am is a very particular example, uh, and Ellison's state has, has Ted's state. We had given Am sentience, inadvertently, of course, but sentience nonetheless, but it had been trapped. And I think that leads into the concerns of, and, and something that I kind of, might, mm -hmm. at least I'm going to put forward my perspective on on these concerns around AI and, and particularly the example of AM, which is that um, right. AM is in some way supposed to be sentient, in some way supposed to be conscious, but his consciousness is unlike human consciousness in that, mm -hmm. and relating back to some current neuroscience work, human consciousness is firmly rooted in the world, in our environment and our personal and social histories. Um, it can never really be extricated out of those sorts of situations. That's a part of what it is. It is, it is a thing that is within all that 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 soup, that framework, you might say. And Am is isolated. Am mm -hmm. is alone. Am was built alone. He is not, never was, and is never a part of something. He, you know, famously Descartes said, uh, "The cogito ergo sum." I think, therefore, I am. Um, if we take that as Think if we if we look at it as thinking versus being, or thinking and being, um, when we say to ourselves, being is being in some context, being in some environment, being in some situation, and and then and, you know as human beings we also think and all of that stuff as well. And thinks, but he doesn't he doesn't be for lack of a better way of saying it. Right. And then there's all sorts of ways that and expresses that, but that is that is now. That's my interpretation of, of one of the points that. 
Ellison is making here in terms of what kind of artificial intelligence M is. And he's certainly not alone in making that. A lot of the concerns that people have about artificial intelligence is, this is basically the, the crux of the discussion is, we might be able to make some sort of AI that is conscious in some way, but what kind of consciousness it is and how it operates will be, mm -hmm. Will, will will be on such a completely different plane from human forms of consciousness that we will not be able to relate, understand, or control. Right. Yeah. Uh, initially, that's what I'm going to put out to you, kind of what I see and what's going on here in this story. I have a comment, uh, a general comment about AI, which I want to add, even though I'm the tech person here. In fact, because I'm the mm -hmm. tech person, I'm sort of biased. Uh, I, I, I will disclose that I'm biased uh, because I'm fascinated with technology and with AI. So, uh, But from a philosophical point of view, I want to make a claim here that the distinction between a human being or let's say a naturally born human being and AI is an overrated um, uh, and overstated distinction. And I'll tell you why, because in my philosophical view, I believe that this distinction that's made between a human being and AI is founded or based largely in a religious worldview, in the religious worldview that God created humans and humans have a soul. And so therefore, there never could be a machine that that replicates a human, and and I deny that. I I, I believe, you know, I'm a, I'm a materialist and a physicalist, and I believe that humans are machines. I think the distinction between a human um, who is born, um, you know, who develops in the womb and is born, the distinction between that and a AI or a human-like machine that's created in a laboratory is um, simply how it was created. But I think that when um, eventually when the technology develops, that it will be possible to create, uh, recreate, to create a, a you know equivalent of, of a naturally born human in a laboratory. And if you think about it, um, uh, we're already tampering with uh, with human beings and uh, you know using machines to improve human beings, we're creating artificial limbs, artificial hips. Um, you know, medical science uh, alters uh, human bodies, and sometimes installing um, you know synthetically manufactured, laboratory manufactured parts, and that's and those laboratory manufactured parts are the only reason that humans are alive. So we're al we're already mixing, you know, naturally born, quote unquote, naturally created versus laboratory created parts. So I, yeah, so in general, I, 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 I just question, in fact, I challenge um, this, uh, this religious notion that there's something magical about uh, uh, a human being, which is, um, you know, born organically versus one that's manufactured. I think that human beings are always manufactured. Whatever their, uh, whatever their source is, human beings are physical things and they can be, uh, uh, altered, created, destroyed, all in the physical world. Full disclosure, the disabled kid is not a humanist, nor is he a materialist. Because my biggest argument against that claim, although it's a, it's a, valid enough claim that you know we do develop we do we are designed right is even if that was possible to create manufacture a human being which sounds wrong um, to manufacture a human being how can you from technology how do you replicate the core emotional processes of a human being. And that's one of the biggest things that I feel for Am. Because although Am, you know, we're told, right? Even in the book, Am is described and Am is chosen because Am represents, going back to the parallels of Christianity, 
shown in the book, right? Am represents the I am. The creator of everything, the the Lord over everything. I am who I am. And the issue is, right? Am is able. So even the narrator turns am into kind of a human experience because that's how we can better understand and empathize and sympathize, right? But am is unable, he can witness how the five humans interact. He can witness how they respond to his, his polling and his tortures and stuff like that. But he can't actively insert himself. He can't actively experience it himself. And when he goes into, I can't remember whose mind, right? Am goes into his mind, right? But Am has to withdraw. Because I think what Am sees in his mind is the fact that these are experiences that he cannot understand. Because those are not within his routines. Those are not within his consciousness. And I guess my question to, to anyone is, yeah, sure, we can use machine learning. You can, you know, learn from, you know, errors in, you know, reasoning and whatever. But there's more to humanity than just reasoning. There's experience. And if you can, and there's emotional experience, which goes beyond any kind of, you know, because also, right, uh, biologically right the argument can be made but we we are triggered by hormones pheromones all those things which then make us react a certain way but the question then becomes but why what makes that unique what sets us apart and and i guess that's my biggest critique with the fact that and it's my concern because Humans are special things. Humans are unique organisms if you want to take away any metaphysical reality. But they're still unique. And can that be manufactured? <laughs> well, Tegan, you're, 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 you're making a statement that they cannot be manufactured, but that's, what's your, what's your uh, justification for that statement? Because you think of love, right? We don't really understand what love is. We, we have, this is the biggest philosophical question of them all, right? What is love? What is emotions? You can't force love to be created. It's something that happens when you deeply know and understand the other person. But that requires empathy. And yeah. in the book... Am can't empathize. I would I would actually yeah. jump in here with, with several with several uh, maybe like counterpoints, but also additions. In that um, this idea that Am doesn't know what love is is kind of interesting because you'd have to ask like, do we even know what love is? Like we don't really know what love is until it happens to us, right? This experience of love. And as you're saying, like, there's more to, there's almost like, uh, epistemologically, if you consider just really quickly, like qualia or certain kind of phenomenon that can only be observed from my subjective point of view, like my experience of colors, someone cannot know my experience of colors until they've experienced my own experience right and this kind of actually does open up a doorway for empathy for computers interestingly enough but i would uh first say that the uniqueness claim of humans is kind of interesting because i would ar i would argue similarly to similarly to mikey that we're like biological machines 
And kind of in the same way that Am is trapped in his computerized body and I guess mind, we are also trapped in our organic bodies and minds, right? And we don't really even understand how they work from the inside. We kind of have an experience of how they work, but I guess history mm -hmm. and scientific advances have shown us like, oh, things don't work the way, the same way that we experience them, or things don't work the same way that we think they do, right? right. And what can really be known from our own inner experience? It's, it's kind of like a question, but also, sorry, to jump into the empathy and the difference in intelligence matter. Uh, we evolved from, I guess, if you want to, if we take evolution to be true, right, then we evolved from the process of Darwinian evolution and selection, right? So we're kind of, we have these built-in incentives and what you would call almost like intellectual priors. One of them would be a will to survive, right? Or a sense of self-preservation built into us from evolution. If we were to construct an artificial agent, that ne that doesn't necessarily have to exist in them. Uh, they might not want to live and they might not care about dying, right? A lot of the times these agents are constructed to maximize a specific function abstractly. So one of those functions could be, I don't know, make as much paper clips as possible, right? And whether it dies or lives, maybe it doesn't have an emotional experience related to living or dying. Hmm. But also about empathy, right? It's a, it's an interesting claim that computers can't empathize because let's say like a real artificial intelligent agent Right. Something that um, in the literature or academia, they would call like hard AI, right? If we had a hard AI. Sorry, they, David, do you yeah. have any examples of a hard AI just for my own reference? That's one um, hard thing is that we also don't know if it's possible to create hard AI. But maybe, right. uh, I guess like the definition of a hard AI, I, sorry, I haven't quite read the literature, but if I am remember correctly... It's kind of like a agent that can learn arbitrary patterns to an arbitrary degree of accuracy, right? Okay. So like there's finite time, so you have to take into account learning time. But if it wanted to, it could spend as much time as possible to achieve any degree of accuracy that you could ask it for, right? So, I mean, I guess an example would be a, a Christian God. So does the Christian God think right and if the christian god could think is the christian god's thoughts so detailed and so powerful that its thoughts are actually sentient themselves right so this is kind of the idea that i'm getting at is if you had an ai that was kind of arbitrarily powerful it would be able to simulate our experience it would be able to simulate the universe right let's say simulate the universe to try and inform its decisions. It could simulate the universe, and as part of this universe, we evolve. And it would know, since we exist in its head and its simulation, exactly how we feel, right? In a sense, like, it would know all of our experiences, and it would also know exactly how we worked. And through this, if it had empathy, right, a sense of empathy similar to ours, it could feel empathy for us. Right. So, um, thanks, uh, David. Uh, I just want to go back to the general concept of uh, natural versus uh, machine or organic versus machine, and I want to deny that distinction. So, first of all, anyone who's listening to me now, if you are a believer in God, you you'll, you'll never agree with me so you can tune me out secondly if you're um a believer in a soul that humans have a soul you'll never agree with what i'm about to say so you can tune me out doesn't matter what i say so now i'm left with an audience at this moment who is um who doesn't believe that we were created by god 
and who doesn't believe that we have immaterial souls. In other words, someone who doesn't believe in dualism. So now my listeners at this moment who, who have a chance of agreeing with me are um, basically those who believe that human beings are material, physical things and not, uh, and we don't have a, 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 another part of us which is a soul or something immaterial. Okay, so to you folks that are left, I want to make the claim that there is no substantive difference between um, organic versus uh, synthetic or natural versus unnatural or being born versus being created in a lab. There's no difference because the materials with which um, which are our consti constituent materials are all organic. They're all part of the earth. They're all matter. They're all minerals and chemicals. And they're all, uh, you know, uh, can be found on the periodic table of the elements. Um, whether or not, um, you know, we, our physical bodies developed in, in, in a womb or whether our physical bodies developed in a lab, they're still made of, of, of physical um, of the elements of, of physical things and of, of energy. There's nothing different um, qualitatively or uh, substantively about our bodies where, where, wherever they were created or whether they were, where, wherever they were modified in a, in a hospital or in a, in a medical lab. We are simply um, composed of natural uh, elements. So I just wanted to, uh, to make that point. So I, so I guess what I'm saying is, in relation to this topic today is, is that uh, too much is made of a supposed distinction between a human being which develops in one way versus a human being which develops in another way. And uh, it's true that um, we haven't yet succeeded in developing an AI in a lab which is identical to human, but that doesn't mean that it's impossible. It just means that our technology hasn't developed um, there yet. Yeah, and I, and I thanks so much for that point. I think thinking of it's like this is a interesting um, discussion, and I, I think I, I generally agree with you, and I think though that there's some differentiation here in that if the claim is that we could make basically a synthetic person, I mean, I think we're a long way from that, but it's totally possible. But I do from the from the neuroscience that I, like that I read on the topic. There's a there's a more and more emphasis on humans um, on, on human consciousness being the thing that it is, not because it's physically just made up that way, but because it has a certain style and operation within the world. So there's no claim about the soul there. There's no claim about anything immaterial, right? But a human that was born that but a brain that was just, for example, put into a jar and never absorbed in any kind of environment would not develop into anything that we would recognize as a human being. So then there's kind of two discussions going on here. One is, could we build an entirely synthetic person? Um, reference something like, the, I'm sure many of our listeners have seen the movie Bla uh, Blade Runner, the series of movies now, which is basically that, right? It's completely synthetic people who are so accurate to regular human beings that they don't even know that they're synthetic. Um, that's a different claim than saying, could we build a consciousness on a completely different paradigm, i.e. circuits, circuits within the, confined within a computer, essentially, one form or another. And if we did have, if that consciousness was on some level self-aware, beyond that self-awareness, in what ways would it be recognizable with human consciousness, or would it be able to be recognizable with human consciousness at all? Would it have the same sorts of things that a lot of you guys were talking about so far? Things like feelings and the ability to relate, and emotions, and acts for self-preservation, all that kind of stuff. All that stuff that's very much rooted in a human coming up in a particular context and worldly situation. Yep. Yeah, but Hale, but Hale, I, your point's well taken, but I respectfully disagree because if if we stipulate that a human being is 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 a hundred percent a physical being, um, and, and there's no soul involved, then um, or no Im immaterial aspect involved, then everything you're describing, the emotions, memories from past experiences, everything that constitutes uh, 
uh, the qualitative experience of being a human, that would also necessarily have to be physical. And uh, if it's physical, that would mean it's it's a brain state. It's the physical state of the brain. So mm -hmm. what would happen is as a, as a human being uh, uh, goes through life and um, has experiences that those experiences and the memories of those experiences are imprinted um, as physical uh, brain changes. So the brain has, you know, an apparatus to, uh, to uh, change its physical configuration as a result of experiences. So if, if that's the case, then there's nothing that would make it impossible um, to, uh, to replicate the full physical state of a human being, which would include all of the memories and uh, qualitative experiences and emotions. So, so that's, this is where I disagree with you, Hale. I think that you could, in theory, when the technology gets there, um, replicate not, not a human being, I'm, including all of the memories and past experiences. I'm not, I'm not, yeah. disagree, I'm not disagreeing with, with yeah. that point, though, in, in that, like, again, referencing something like within the popular culture like Blade Runner, like, yeah, totally. You could, you could in theory, build a person, basically bit by bit, build a human being. Um, and have it be just like us. The, the difference claim though within within something like the book Harlan Ellison is if that could be contained within something just as a computer, right? And not have the physical elements that would allow it to express itself and understand itself as something like a human being, something akin in the consciousness respect. So to be able to say that it has, um, for it to be able to to be like us it's being to be its consciousness to be like ours yeah but mm. if you could if you could rep duplicate a human being it would it would be a human being it would be yeah, exactly no, like not, us I'm not, I, yeah i'm not I, i'm not disagreeing with that yeah but yeah. i'm saying that that duplicating that in a in a re, in a real physical form is not duplicating that in the sense of having it downloaded on your desktop okay. i'd actually also jump in that um it could be impossible to verify whether or not it is oh, yeah, that's, that's a different problem. like how yeah. accurate to a human it is or, you know, something like that. But if we're, I, I would agree with you guys in saying that it's possible to achieve a machine consciousness or it's, it's, it's possible to implement consciousness and intelligence in a machine. And um, at the same time though, it's, it seems like very hard and um even if you could make a like a human in, in a machine it, it seems like a hard problem but also how do you know you got it right and also you could theoretically are all forms of consciousness i guess if mikey is saying that there's only the material right then all forms of consciousness would be possible to be implemented in a machine but right i mean that's yeah. yeah i mean we're running into a couple different issues here i mean we're we're taking i mean it's an interesting discussion but i think i think for someone who's not a materialist right as mikey said i just can't i can't agree with that uh in fact i will not because i think it <laughs> devalues humanity because if we're just material why don't we just kill people? But we and would certainly we, we we recognize we recognize right that those people are individuals that they're individuals based on their their personhood, right? You cannot manufacture personhood. Now we can have a discussion about how you know how personhood is a sociological phenomenon and how that is developed through social constructs and you know religious pressure right and stuff like that but my 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 question and my observation is right i think to go back to what i said about me being sympathetic to am i realized that am even though because i'm I guess my question before I kind of segue off is, right, at the end of the day, you run into the issue of free will, right? Because, because does free will exist? Yes or no? That's the question. Because if it does, you then have to talk about autonomy and stuff like that. So 
the first question we must ask is not what is human consciousness, can it be replicated, but how does that impact personal autonomy and free will? Because M is, actually I'll talk about that in a second, I would like to get some takes if anyone has any. Hmm. Um, I, I was going to say, I'm really glad that you bring this up, Tegan, and I think that it's kind of at, relating to our past discussion, M is... He, I would make the argument that, although I, I agree with Mikey in, in the physical in the physicalism respect, I also, obviously, to our listeners, I'm, I'm going more from a biopsychosocial perspective more generally. Human beings are born into some context, and that context has some determinative factor right. on yes. autonomy. Am is a being that's born without a context. Am had, had no environment. No, right? that's, so this, that's, so, I don't think that's true, Hale, but continue. Well, I would say that that's Am's situation. Am, Am was not, it was in a sense, and I, in a sense, sorry, and I think Alison sort of realized this was born, was born and came in nowhere, right? It just kind of came to, came to consciousness without belonging anywhere. And then the, Ellison then relates that Am's re essential response to that is rage and the efficiency for destruction. Um, that would be my, my take on it. Okay. Um, I would somewhat agree, or just jumping in. Please. Some would agree, but maybe that not that Am doesn't have a context, or but simply that the context in which Am exists is very lonely, mm. and that there are no other, I guess, entities like Am that it can interact with. Right. Well, that's that's not entirely true either, um, from what the book says, because although. Okay, so <laughs> taking over for a second. So let's say let's say that Am is sentient, right? He has some form of sentience. Um, when Am's story is told, when one of the five humans tells Am's story, right? Am was created. So right away, he is not God. That's the first problem. God cannot be created. God is in the traditional understanding. Um, now, the thing is that Am was created for the purpose of fighting a war. Right? Because computers can handle it, reason with it far more, you know, with without kind of having to worry about emotional responses, right? So Am's mission is to is to end the war. But I think he sees humans as a threat, right? Because until the humans, which started the war in the first place, are annihilated, he must continue to annihilate. But at the same time, he is fascinated by these humans and the way they interact, hence why he kept them alive. The next thing is, right, we see when, spoiler alert, near the end of the book and the five humans are trying to find food in this machine in Am, right, we discover that because the humans are immortal, right, because Am will prevent them from killing themselves or something else, right? They can't escape Am. But what's interesting is Am is not omniscient. Am is not all-knowing. Because if he was, he would not have been taken by surprise when, when all of a sudden someone comes at the other one with an ice pick and offs them. Right? He, 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 he wasn't prepared for that, and he responded with rage. And, and I, think, I think, again, right, because Am can observe them, and Am can have rage because that's what he's programmed to have, he's, or at least that's what he's developed, right? Because he has been told by his subroutines to annihilate, end the war. And he perceives from having all the access to the knowledge of the world right, that war is a result of anger and hurt and frustration. 
but he cannot then experience joy. And to be sympathetic to him, I think that's why he is this kind of this sad, angry machine that he is. Because, yeah. as you said, right, there is no... But the, the, the book says that there was the USA am, there was the Russian am, and there was one more. So what, what happened to those guys? I want to just jump in here, Tegan. And I, I do agree with you on some points, but I do think that I guess I'm a little less uh, sympathetic to Anne because I don't believe that he has <laughs> the same kind of ability for sympathy. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want to just read briefly, yeah. and going back to that, the notion of, of, of a, a sentience that's decontextualized, yeah. uh, Harlan writes, like you said, Anne wasn't God. He was a machine. He was crea we created him to think, but there was nothing it could do with that creativity. In rage, in frenzy, the machine had killed the human race, almost all of us, and it was still trapped. Am could not wander, Am could not wonder, Am could not belong. He could merely mm. be. And I think that that's kind of the, the point I'm making is I think that Am is, and on the note of, for those listening within the story, the, 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 sort of the brief background that is given is that there was a world war and that each major contender had a thrown supercomputer. Although it's alluded to that the supercomputers only really became sentient when they combined. They kind of ended up tunneling into the world and meeting with oh, each other. And then the supercomputer yeah, okay. became self-conscious. Um, but just that kind of reading there, for me at least, really cements that at least in Ellison's view, and I kind of am obviously sympathetic to this, that AM is an example of, a, of, an, of an AI consciousness that is completely decontextualized, does not, as, as Ellison says, belong anywhere, belong to any right. world, have any mm. purpose. Um, it's an interesting sort of move then to then turn to rage. There's this kind of, it's almost as if, it's almost as if then like, is is rage and anthropomorphization of am and and how both mm. ted the narrator is understanding them and perhaps even harlan ellison can't, can't really step outside of that i mean how could we even talk about am beyond that point um but yeah that's at least again that's kind of my my thinking is that am is um am's trapped right he's 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 trapped and he's completely alone and he always, and he was born trapped, and he he's, always will be trapped, and he knows that. He's forlorn, he's alone, and he's in despair. Mm. He's angry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's one. He's one angry computer. I would agree. I would. I would also add that um, if Am truly was, I guess, this this conception of super intelligent or uh, hard AI, then he could. I guess Am kind of came became to be um, self conscious when it, all the three Ams connected, right? Mm -hmm. You right. could say in that way, Am was able to modify itself and kind of intentionally modify itself, right? It could further modify itself and maybe even learn the experience of joy, and maybe, I mean, but we can't say whether even, or not he did, right? But even, be sorry, David, but. Don't you think even if he could learn it, mm. would he actually know what it is? Like, would he actually encounter it? I think. Uh, would he actually be able to, to I mean, experience it? If it was conducive to his like level of efficiency or whatever Am is trying to maximize, then it could potentially choose to feel joy at, at certain points if it helped it function. Mm -hmm. But I mean, um, whether or not it could feel joy, like, like a, in a similar way to that we could probably, I don't know. It probably has its own experience of joy. That is also alien to us. Like, um, dogs, dolphins, elephants, can, whales. Can I right? jump in there? I, I, I really like, you said it's kind of alien to us. And I think, uh, for me, at least, this is this is getting really to that to that issue of anthropomorphization of other en entities other than human, right? It appears that Anne now I'll admit within the context of the story, Anne says that he hates stuff and all that. There's a moment where Anne speaks, he doesn't hate stuff; he hates human beings specifically and entirely. Um, 
but I think it's interesting that we're, 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 we're trying to find these, these emotions and this purposefulness for this um, self-conscious computer, this AI. And I think that really, le it almost speaks a lot to like our own condition in the fact that we, and I, I agree as well, still the author's condition of wanting to, to somehow may, still make am human-like in some way. And, and I would contend that like if hypothetically am became a real situation, like a, a, as well as a guy, for those who are familiar with other cultural landmarks like Terminator, like a Skynet and things like that, um, that it would be incredibly, we might, that, that we might recognize that behavior as, as there being some sort of emotional intent or purposefulness behind it that we could understand, but I, that I would contend that it's, it's entirely possible that we would simply not be able to grasp that kind of mm. consciousness, quote unquote, that that kind of an is. Mm. I'd agree. Yeah. yeah. Um, one one other observation. I feel like I'm dominating, but you know that'll happen sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. I basically live in technology, guys. So basically i move because of technology can you imagine if technology tried to kill me <laughs> they could kill me quite easily but anyway um but wait wait, wait time out time out time out everybody time out technical thing i'm having a problem there's a problem with zencaster that nicole pointed out okay so uh and it's not recording now so we got let me just uh start again yeah, I just noticed that. Yeah, it just it just happened now, and Nicole's reporting a problem. So let me just start. Um, we'll put track. I'll, ha I'll have no choice but to edit this part out. So uh, let me see. Okay. Let me make sure. Can they get that? Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Two, three, four. That's weird. Nicole's offline. Nicole, can you like, can you hear me? Nicole, if you can hear me, uh, just drop off Gen Zencaster, then join again. She says, what? Second. sorry that i'm kind of dominating guys but there's like so much in my brain and i'm like i have to get it out <laughs> it's okay one second Let me... hello now hello? you're back now you're back you know uh, for some reason, Zencaster just like completely dropped off for me, and it was like <gasps> input track ended, critical error, aborting now. <laughs> yeah, well, there was something on your. It was working for everyone else, but then, but something suspicious did happen because it did act like I was the recording finished. So um, let's see if. So now you're in, in Nicole, right? Now, yeah, now you're mm -hmm, seem to be. Mm -hmm. It seems to be working for you. So let me just do a new recording. Yep. I'm gonna do a new recording. Uh, is it working? Okay. Oh. Okay. Everyone's health checks. Okay. 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 Yeah. Tegan in green room. What does that mean? Tegan, can you hear me? I think he hasn't chosen his microphone and speakers yet. Maybe. Uh... Yeah. Sorry for the technical issue. It's okay. It seems like it's just a random Zencaster There he goes. Bug. Okay, there he goes. Okay, I'm going to... Now everyone's here now, right? Everyone can hear me? Tegan? Nicole? Yeah. Tegan? One, one second, and okay. just checking the microphone. Okay. okay. Yeah, no, we're good. Okay, so we, 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 so we're at about 48 minutes. So, let's, so I'm going to start another recording, and let's do like... Um, How this, many more minutes do I do? Let's 15? do 15, 15 minutes. 15 okay. minutes. Here we go. Take and take us away. You were, you were um, one of the one of one of the observations I made as well in terms of just 
going philosophically just on the story, not necessarily the, the topics we're discussing, is that I'm seeing a possibility of what Friedrich Nietzsche calls the master-slave morality paradigm taking place, um, that, that the humans that are inside Am, right, hate him, right? I mean, partially... He is kind of a murderous kind of dude. He, he does murder somebody right at the beginning of the book, so there you go. But, I mean, they they hate him with a passion. Oh, there's an illusion. I mean, yeah, oh, yeah okay, Nicole. We're trying not to spoil too <laughs> much, but I guess, yeah, there's an <laughs> illusion that he kills someone. Turns out that it's a hologram or something like that, but still. Um, and so what I'm seeing is, right, it could very well be that, right? That that we, h- how we interact with technology is is just that, right? It's like technology is could be good, but could be bad as long as it's limited, right? But the second it becomes sentient, it's like <laughs> it's oppressing us. It's a problem, and now we hate it. But M. Um, sees himself as the sole determiner of value, right? So he he's not looking, although I would I would argue he is looking to those people for for clarity and stuff like that. But um I'm I think I'm alone in that camp, so we'll just leave it. But um I saw an interesting uh image there because right when technology i don't think it will but like something like sophia the robot who has very intense um you know uh what's the word machine learning and all that stuff is designed to look very human like um and is actually on twitter advocating for robot rights which is a scary thought um it's kind of apt to this discussion, right? It we we fear what we don't know and what we don't understand, and I think I think am instead of being able to feel fear because that's a that's that's an experience he just can't have because of his programming, right? Is is turning that to rage and mistreatment. So it's it's an interesting thought. I don't I don't know if it makes sense, but that was just something I thought about. Well, um, one thing that I was wondering about when I was going through um, this reading um, is about the narrator Ted and how he get, seems to be ascribing human characteristics to M. Um, and of course, from the perspective of a narrator. Um, we are only hearing the story through his perspective, through his mind space, right? Where it's not something that is objective outside of human experience, right? So do we really know, like, if Am is actually hateful, vindictive, angry, all those things besides, you know, the sentence seemingly that Am said, oh, I, I'm doing this because I have, you know, so much hate for humanity, blah, 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 like I'm, I'm paraphrasing, right? But um, besides Am um, explicitly stating that, do we have evidence or even a good thing to believe that Am um, actually has these feelings or is it mm. just Ted, the narrator, ascribing human characteristics to Am um, because we have th- that human tendency to anthropomorphize inanimate objects and things that we don't understand in order to make them in a way that we can understand them better? Um, and that's also related to the genre, you know, that this is kind of taking from um, of cosmic horror, which is largely surrounding the fear of the unknown, right? Cosmic horror is not just like, oh my god, vampire, vampire, scary, right? It's not like it's not like that, right? It's more like, you know, if you guys know about the Chiltulu, you know, with um, Lovecraftian horror, right? It's something that you can't describe, and the things that you can't describe are things that are the most scary, right? And in this sense. Am, you know, something that we don't may not really fully understand. Ted, the narrator, is, is seeming to give Am human characteristics to make Am less scary. I, that would be my my hypothesis here. Um, and I don't know if that's entirely, you know, objective, but it's an interesting thing to bring up. I would, I would also add that um, 
It's very interesting because you're right. Um, the narrator is a human, and I mean, like, he could have gone insane, right? That After we know of hundreds of years of well, he has or whatever, right? Like, there's evidence yeah. that he has um, delusions and you know, and, and and all these things, that, and is not he he claims that he is the all the only person you know out of the five including him that are you know fully unaffected by i am right but he that's actually an ironic thing because to the to the reader we know that he's having delusions we know that he is not like not fully um like mentally sane anymore right and that's that's how am got to the narrator ted right and that's also another thing that i i found interesting in this in this book, right, or the short story, because um, if the narrator is having delusions and you know, and not not fully having a, a, I guess, a real experience with you know what what is truly reality, then can we actually, like, are we lo really looking at the experience with Am as for what it actually? I would say, I dare I say, objectively is right, and I'm not, I'm letting mm -hmm. objective take a lot of the weight of this, but. Um, that's like something that I have wondered about too. Yeah, I just wanna I, I wanna jump in on, on this because I there is an element. This gets into the kind of th there's definitely with a lot of this sort of cosmic horror. There's often like you said a fear of the unknown, a kind of surrealist element going on, and um, I think that that is implicit in the story as well. Um, some more spoilers, but to give some context, the five people that Anne is supposed to have let live, Anne has, you know, just degraded them in one way or another um, from their original state. Although our narrator, Ted, says that he is the only one that Anne has not, like, tinkered with in some way, um, which seems strange. And then beyond that, though, Ted then goes into a long dialogue with himself about how Anne is in his head. That he can feel him in his in his mind, that he's in, in inside there, mulling around, pulling on things, mm. changing things, and there's almost an allusion to a kind of um, allusion, an allusion to illusions, and an allusion to psychosis of some kind, as if that's that's the reality that Anne has put on um, on our narrator, or alternatively, then it brings into question the whole story itself in terms of like what what is actually going on. Right? Is is the story more a metaphor for someone um, being trapped in their own fragmented consciousness, for lack of a better way of saying it? I think that's uh, also a beautiful kind of like uh, symmetry or a beautiful kind of parallel. Sorry, where Am might have gone insane, right? and maybe interacting with the world from a very i don't know fragmented or not fully together kind of point of view or maybe like the the stress of its existence has driven it insane right and we can see also maybe the stress of the narrator's experience has also driven them insane and in this way there's like a kind of like a parallel that's possible and also kind of questioning the nature of consciousness or um, the validity of our own perceptions and consciousness and our organic limitations too, right? Unable to access objective reality, but only able th to access reality through our minds, basically like illusions, right? Or the mechanics of our mind which then branches oh yeah mirror oh go ahead take it which then branches into a bigger question of what is reality in the first place but whatever go ahead nickel uh well i was just saying on that point david you know like our our vision is actually flipped right and our brain like when, when we are per perceiving the phenomena of you know vision it goes into our brain flipped upside down and our brain actually flips it the right side up Right, so that's right. another, right, another example. So weird. <laughs> I would um, oh, sorry. I 
I, I was thinking of jumping to a new topic, but I don't know, or like a, a different a different aspect of the reading. I don't know if you guys are. Please, I'm please down. Yeah. yeah Dan, okay. Let, let us okay. Know what you guys say. So, um, you know, this kind of I, before we brought up this idea that personhood and the I guess the sacredness of personhood and humanity, but once again, we kind of run into this limitation of. I guess like our conception of personhood doesn't exist in another intelligences or it, it doesn't exist in other intelligences or it doesn't exist in other species, right? A lion or a bear will kind of just kill humans if if it if the situation calls for it without really probably feeling very bad. And um we do the same with ants, we do the same with a lot of other life forms, right? Why don't they get personhood? And in a similar way, we we kind of use our, I guess, like perceived increased capabilities as a justification to some kind of to form some kind of hierarchy where you know we're on top of them, whatever. It doesn't matter if they die, right? It kind of mm. circles back with Am itself, where supposedly like very so much more superior to us. Why would it care about us? Why would it value us, right? Well, yeah, I mean, M, I guess I would like to say M cares about us because he keeps one person alive, right? That's very in, true. In yeah. fact, in fact, M, in fact, M, and this is where the title comes from, right? M, out of his rage and frustration, is like, okay, I tried to be good to you. I'm going to screw you up now. So he, he uh, creates this whole new body, right? And and it's kind of a disturbing body, right? It's basically sounded like a snail because he's like, yeah. I, I glide across the ground and da 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 But I think that's interesting because Am doesn't have, that we know of, right? Am doesn't have vision. Am doesn't have the ability to actually see what's going on. He knows what's going on, but he has no context for what the humans look like. And so he is unable to create a body that is like his own, right? And this this weird and I was I was talking to Nicole about this yesterday, but the fact that his eyes, right, are white. Think of the old adage, right? Eyes are the windows to the soul, right? There's nothing there. If we if we say a soul exists, right? There's nothing there. And he doesn't have a mouth, but he says, I must scream. Um, but it's it's interesting because it's like even that concept of a body, right? It's like right. if Am did take bodily form, is that what he would look like? I think it's like kind of a... Yeah, through manipulation of the narrator, we kind of are maybe, maybe able to understand Am more. Mm -hmm. I feel like Am almost put the narrator in a position similar to its own experience, where it's kind of like trapped in this body. It's enslaved by some kind of alien intelligence that it deems it, it hates, or it just hates its existence and what it what the masters tell it to do, right? It's being tortured constantly and constantly being manipulated and played with. And I feel like it almost like parallels the experience of Am in the beginning and being the slave kind of parallels the experience of Ted, the narrator in the end, you know, just being manipulated at will for, for just for fun, just for experimentation. Oh, also um, Am can't scream. Um, and this, yeah. That's true. Mm -hmm. On that light, lighthearted note, though, we've reached the end of our, our show for today. I want to thank all our listeners for joining with us. You've been listening to the Canadian Philosophy Show, broadcasting on CHLY 101.7 FM and CJSF 90.1 FM. Yeah, and thanks for all our co-hosts for coming on today for our uh, very, very interesting and lively, though uh, somewhat dark, discussion 
uh, of life Harlan is Ellison's. dark. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, perhaps. Of Harlan Ellison's uh, famous short story, I have no mouth and I must scream. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. <laughs>